The Ottoman Empire lasted for 600 years and dominated the Middle East and Europe, from Budapest to Baghdad and everything in between. Its sultans ruled three continents, but they didn't do it on their own. This podcast looks at the cast of characters who made the empire run, the sultan, the queen mother, the harem eunuch, the merchant, the peasant, the janissary, the holy man, and the outlaw. Welcome to Ottoman Lives. Hey everyone, welcome back to our series, Ottoman Lives, looking at the cast of characters that make up the Ottoman Empire. We're going to look now at the eunuch. This is one of the most exotic subjects in the Ottoman Empire. It's like something out of Arabian Nights, out of a fairy tale set in the Middle East. And eunuchs, interestingly, were at the center of the Ottoman government. Some of them held significant political power. But despite being at key centers of power for over three centuries, Eunuchs remain something of a mystery. They always seem to be background players and sources. They don't get biographical attention like sultans do. There aren't long descriptions of them or accounts of their early lives. So they're hard to track down, and they're always mentioned in passing, as if they're the furniture of the imperial palace, even though they're the ones making key decisions when it comes to the harem, when it comes to how administration is done, when it comes to how palace court life is conducted. When the palace was the nerve center of the Ottoman Empire throughout its classical age, they were key power players, even though we don't know that much about their backgrounds. But when we read about eunuchs, it seems like we're reading about a bizarrely different world that was really at the heart of Istanbul until about 100 years ago. Well, let's go back to where eunuchs are in court life in the Middle East before the Ottoman Empire. The use of eunuchs was not just restricted to the Ottoman Empire or Islamic civilizations. Some people think that using eunuchs in the imperial household was something that the Ottomans adopted from the Byzantines after they conquered Constantinople in 1453. And the seclusion of women in the harem was something that mirrored the Byzantine practice of separate women's apartments. But really, eunuchs show up in the great Islamic empires beginning at least with the Abbasids in 750 AD. East African eunuchs seem to have been particularly popular as harem guardians for reasons that remain unclear, but probably because that was the easiest country to obtain them from. And what I mean by that is that there were ancient slave markets in that part of Africa, so it was simply easier to get slaves there. We see tropes of African harem eunuchs in the Thousand and One Nights tales, many of which depict life at the Abbasid court in Baghdad. So the role of eunuchs in Islamic states and the Ottoman Empire was this. The ruler maintained eunuchs or castrated males who were brought in as slaves to guard and serve the female members of the royal household. And as we're going to see in this series with the concubine, women were always kept in separate quarters in the imperial palace and sometimes at wealthy households, so this is why eunuchs are important. But eunuchs had to be obtained from Africa for this reason. Islam had forbidden self-castration by Muslims or castration of one Muslim by another. So eunuchs were bought in slave markets of Egypt, the Balkans, and southern Caucasus, where there was a Christian population. This is sort of kind of a moral laundering, where even though in their own religion castration was forbidden, they simply bought castrated slaves who were castrated by someone else. So they were actually created in the market for this practice because eunuchs could fetch a high price on the slave market, They were incentivizing people to do castration, even though they themselves did not do it. So this is a kind of moral laundering going on. In the palace, there were two categories of eunuchs, the black eunuch and white eunuch. Black eunuchs were Africans or African origin, mostly from Sudan, Ethiopia, and the East African coastal region. They were sent to the Ottoman court by the governor of Egypt. They served the female members of the royal family, who resided in the sultan's harem. The white eunuchs were mostly white men imported from the Balkans and the Caucasus and served the recruits at the palace school. The black eunuchs underwent a more radical form of castration, whereas in the case of the white eunuchs, only their testicles were removed, neither of which were a walk in the park. But the most important figure in the eunuch power structure was the chief black eunuch, who served as the Kuzlar al or the chief of women, also considered the chief of the harem. He was in charge of the harem and a large group of eunuchs who worked under his direct supervision. 
so the chief black eunuch enjoyed close proximity to the sultan and his family. He would be known well by women who would later become queen mothers and give birth to future sultans. And there were periods, especially in the 1600s and 1700s, when women practically ran the empire through weak husbands, weak sons, and eunuchs were critical in this power politics. All right, so that's the overview of eunuchs. I want to circle back around to some of these issues. Now, why were eunuchs brought from Africa beyond just their availability in slave markets? Well, availability was the key factor, first of all. Egypt could easily tap into the ancient slave caravan routes that ran through Sudan, and these slave routes had existed for centuries, so there'd always been slave markets there going back to the Byzantine Empire, the Roman period, other time periods. While the Muslim kingdoms that emerged along Africa's Red Sea coast during the medieval period raided the kingdom of Ethiopia for slaves, whom they shipped across the Red Sea to the Arabian Peninsula. The Ottomans in the late 16th century conquered a good chunk of the Horn of Africa, as well as part of Sudan, to give them direct control over the slave trade routes. But another reason, apart from availability, that eunuchs came from Africa was the culture and linguistic differences between the African harem eunuchs and the harem residents, who, under the Ottomans, came from the Balkans and the Caucasus, would have prevented meaningful contact between the eunuchs and the women they were guarding, at least in the case of young harem women and young harem eunuchs. In later life, harem women, and above all the sultan's mother, was able to forge influential political partnerships with the most senior harem eunuchs. But this cultural division was a good way for the sultan and his family to play these different groups off of each other. It's part of the reason that there was a benefit when you enslave someone to take them far away from their homeland so that they were in an alien world and isolated and could be put under control more easily. Even the earliest Ottoman sultans had harems guarded by eunuchs, and there was presumably always a head eunuch, but the office of chief harem eunuch was created only in 1588 almost 300 years after the Ottoman Empire emerged, and well over a century after the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople. Sultan Murad III, who ruled from 1574 to 1595, inaugurated the post when he transferred supervision of the imperial pious foundations for the Muslim holy cities of Mecca and Medina to the head of the harem eunuchs from the head of the white eunuchs. The Ottoman sultan derived a good amount of his international prestige from his status as the guardian of the two holy cities of Islam and the guardian of pious foundations that supplied grain and services to the poor of Mecca and Medina. Since land and properties throughout the empire were endowed to these foundations, the chief harem eunuch had a network of clients in every province who ensured that grains and revenues were delivered every year. So the chief black eunuch controlled a vast network throughout the empire. And he had particular power in Egypt, which was the breadbasket of the empire, and supplied most of the grain to the holy cities. The continuous connection to Egypt perhaps explains why, beginning early in the 17th century, most eunuchs were exiled to Cairo once they were removed from office. By the 1640s, an entire exiled eunuch neighborhood had sprung up to the west of Cairo Citadel. The office of the chief harem eunuch and its evolution mirrored developments in the Ottoman Empire as a whole. The office was created just before the economic and political crises of the 17th century in the empire, when a series of sultans died in their 20s or even in their late teens, leaving no heirs or tiny children. In this stormy environment, the chief harem eunuch, along with the sultan's mother, were the main influence on the sultan's development as a statesman. In the Ottoman court and other wealthy households, eunuchs served as neutral, unthreatening, non-gendered emissaries where men and women were sharply divided between themselves. They moved between different groups of people and had information from all sides in a way that few people did. At their peak, there may have been as many as 800 court eunuchs organized in a hierarchical, well-defined power structure. There was a sort of meritocracy in place for the court eunuch system. Eunuchs who served the sultan favorably and those who learned Turkish and converted to Islam could progress in the system. A few would get appointment to administrative posts in the empire, some serving in Cairo and Medina. So this is an interesting paradox at work. 
African eunuchs in the Ottoman Empire who were slaves and could often be the subject of contempt and ridicule, they were ethnic minorities, sometimes they could amass amazing power. And this isn't so different from Serbian or Bosnian boys that were collected in the Devshirme system and then would become Janissaries or could become chief advisors to the sultan, were from poor Balkan backgrounds, or even the concubines and wives of the sultan. These could be Greek women or Russian or Crimean women, also of Christian background who had come to the empire. It's just one of the features of the Ottoman Empire, where they would take people from lowly backgrounds. You would enter a system where you could rise to positions of incredible power, but because your power depended on the household of the sultan, that was your first loyalty, and your chances of a rebellion were lower. Now a little bit more about the power of the chief black eunuch. He carried out overt and covert missions for the sultan, and was the only officer permitted at all times to request an audience with the sultan. An extraordinary privilege because before you have bureaucracy built up in the 1700s and 1800s in the Ottoman Empire, the government a lot of times was really the person of the sultan and the people in the orbit of the sultan. So personal contacts meant something in a way that they really don't mean now. The chief black eunuch had the authority to grant favors through which they could add to their riches, but these riches would revert to the sultan after their death because they obviously had no heirs. And the chief black eunuch also helped with state appointments, served as a supervisor to places under Ottoman domination. They oversaw the building and rebuilding of mosques in Istanbul and elsewhere. They administered the properties and estates of the sultan's mother and their children. They helped train young members of the court. And they were entrusted with the sacred standard of the prophet Muhammad, a very important symbolic role. So that's what the chief black eunuchs did. Now, here are some other privileges of the eunuchs. Regardless of their race, ethnic origin, or degree and intensity of castration, they had privileges like lavish clothing and accommodations in keeping with their high status. They had access to the best education available. So it's not surprising that many chief eunuchs were avid readers and book collectors who established impressive libraries. And it was important that they were well-educated because the chief black eunuch was responsible not only for the training and supervision of the newly arrived eunuchs, but also supervised the daily education and training of the crown prince of the Ottoman Empire. The chief black eunuch used his position and access to the throne to gain power and influence over the sultan and government officials. His access to the sultan and close relationship with his mother and favorite concubines of his royal master made him an influential player in court schemes and intrigues. By the beginning of the 17th century, the chief black eunuch was at times second only to the sultan and the grand vizier in power, and sometimes he was the most powerful person in the empire. The reason this happened in the 17th century is because from this point onward, you have sultans who come to the throne who are almost completely raised on the inner compounds in the palace. Earlier sultans would have served in a province as a governor, but these later sultans lack that experience. And these sultans didn't have their own retinue outside of Istanbul that would form the nucleus of his government and court when he came to the throne. The retinue of the sultan and his patronage network consisted almost completely of those who were part of this court system, including the eunuchs. One eunuch who expertly exploited this system is someone we're going to look at quite a bit, and that's El Haj Mustafa A. He held the office of chief eunuch throughout Ahmed I's reign in the early 1600s, becoming the royal favorite par excellence. After the untimely death of Ahmed's mother, Handan Sultan in 1605, Mustafa A enjoyed exclusive access to Ahmed since he was now the highest authority in the royal palace. Thanks to his position, he was not only able to obtain enormous wealth and control almost all petitions and information addressed to the sultan, he also distributed patronage and wealth, both in the sultan's name and in his own name. By the mid-17th century, the position and function of the chief black eunuch was solidly entrenched, and this lasted for about a hundred years. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. But despite how much power they could hold, all black eunuchs remained outsiders and strangers in Ottoman society. The Ottoman power structure incorporated black eunuchs, but Ottoman society did not integrate them. 
And once we get into the 19th century, when slavery is being abolished internationally and the slave trade is cut down, black eunuchs continue to function in the Ottoman Empire, really up to its end in the 1920s. But they come to be seen as an embarrassing throwback, especially as the Ottoman Empire is trying to modernize and they're seen as part of a corrupted old order. When the Ottoman court is completely abolished in 1923 and the Republic of Turkey comes into existence, the court eunuchs no longer have any role. Well, let's zero in on one particular black eunuch and look at his life. Here's a description of the chief harem eunuch of the Ottoman Empire by the French merchant Jean-Claude Flachat, a frequent visitor to the Ottoman palace during the early 1750s. One rarely finds a eunuch who has, like him, an open forehead, a well-made nose, large clear eyes, a small mouth, rosy lips, dazzling white teeth, a neck of exact proportion without wrinkles, handsome arms and legs, all the rest of his body supple and unconstrained, more fat than thin. Lashat was speaking of a man who had been enslaved in his native Ethiopia, then transported to Upper Egypt for castration, then sold on Cairo's slave market. He would have been presented by the Ottoman governor of Egypt, or one of Egypt's grandees, and entered the harem as one of several hundred subordinate harem eunuchs. Then he would have worked his way up the harem eunuch hierarchy over several decades before achieving the ultimate office on the death of his predecessor. This account comes from Jane Hathaway, who wrote a biography of Bashir Ah called Chief Eunuch of the Ottoman Imperial Harem. Hathaway notes that the Ottomans are following a custom of eunuchs that had been going on for centuries, but also managed to tweak and change this institution to meet their own needs. We see stone depictions of eunuchs from the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which ruled northern Iraq and Syria, going all the way back to 900 BC. They depict smooth-cheeked young men attending the heavily bearded emperor during his hunts. In fact, all pre-modern empires in the Eastern Hemisphere, with the exception of Western Europe and Russia, had eunuchs at their courts. By the early 18th century, El Hajj Bashir Ah, who ruled from 1717 to 1746, was the longest-serving and most powerful chief eunuch in Ottoman history. He presided over elaborate nighttime garden parties where many European dignitaries attended. He was, according to European observers, a vizier maker who decided who the chief advisor of the sultan would be. This is in contrast to earlier eunuchs who served at the pleasure of the grand viziers who came to power. But after his death in 1746, Ottoman grand viziers began to compete with the chief eunuch for influence, and they often prevailed, especially later on with the westernizing reforms from the mid to late 19th century, where the power of the chief eunuch is finally eclipsed, ultimately leading to his downfall. Now getting back to Bashir Ah's life, He's, by many accounts, the most powerful person in the Ottoman Empire in the early 1700s. We don't have a lot of records on his early life, but he was one of thousands of boys swept up in the brutal swirl of the sub-Saharan slave trade. He came to Topkapa Palace at a young age to serve in the capital of Istanbul. Bashir Ah held various positions before he was appointed as chief eunuch. Like other officials, Eunuchs were always vulnerable to shifts in the political winds, and Beshirah was exiled to Cyprus for obscure reasons in 1713. But they couldn't have been too serious of reasons, because he was soon employed again as one of dozens of eunuchs protecting the mosque of the Islamic prophet Muhammad in Medina. He was recalled to Istanbul in 1716, at around the age of 60, to be appointed as chief harem eunuch under Sultan Ahmed III. Ahmed III's reign is associated with the Tulip era, a period of cultural flourishing and extensive European contact in the Ottoman Empire, where lots of tulips were planted, that's why it's called this, and it also saw the introduction of the first Ottoman language printing press. Bashir Ah took advantage of this innovation and built up a big library collection in the 18th century. He was also on the hard edge of Ottoman imperial politics for three decades from his 60s incredibly into his 90s. He deposed the previous Grand Vizier, an office that had practically displaced the Sultan as the empire's decision maker, and he did this within a year of his own appointment as chief eunuch. He then proved instrumental in promoting his favored person, Nevshehirli Ibrahim Pasha, to the post of Grand Vizier. 
The Sultan Ahmed III was overthrown in 1730, but Beshir Ah remained as chief eunuch under Sultan Mahmud I. Throughout the reign of both, he built up an extensive patron-client relationship and accumulated great power. He brought the office of chief black eunuch to the pinnacle of its political and economic influence and made the chief eunuch the main force in the education of Ottoman princes and shaping Ottoman sultans. Bashir Ah also left his mark on the Ottoman brand of Orthodox Sunni Islam of the Hanafi legal right. Before his death in 1746, by then he was well into his 90s, Bashir Ah became one of the wealthiest, most powerful, and longest-lived chief harem eunuchs in Ottoman history. Although the Ottoman harem would see a number of influential chief eunuchs right up to the empire's demise following World War I, there would never be a single chief eunuch who would occupy the office for so long or exercise such a monopoly on power. The chief eunuch was a paradoxical position. They were elite slaves. Even though they were brutally castrated, they received all the privileges that accompany their high status. While a great number of those who were singled out as eunuchs in Africa ended up dying during the castration process, a few rose to the very top of power. Let's look at how the institution dies out. There was a long, slow death of the office of imperial eunuch. The end began to come with the end of slavery in the Ottoman Empire. During the second half of the 19th century, the slave trade to and in the Ottoman Empire was gradually being suppressed. Trafficking in of Africans was prohibited in 1857, but lingered on in varying degrees until the last decade of the 1800s. The role of Great Britain in causing the end of the slave trade was crucial, but British success was limited to the suppression of the African slave trade. By the end of the 19th century, anti-slave trade conventions and geopolitical conditions put a stop to the importing of African slaves to the empire. The westernization of the upper classes of the Ottomans also brought about a certain change in the outlook on how they perceived traditional ways. But the Ottoman household kept its traditions to the very end of the empire, and they kept doing their old ways of business despite public criticism. So with the abolishment of the House of Osman, many of these former eunuchs retired and lived in Istanbul, some living until the 1930s or 1940s as part of city life there. So in conclusion, eunuchs were advantaged people who were positioned at the crossroads of sensitive information and knew many of the innermost secrets of many court figures. Serving as a conduit for such information was one of their main tasks at the palace. They were trusted, but also suspected and manipulated at the same time. But if they were wise, they could benefit in this process and manipulate it to their own ends. So that's all for this episode of Ottoman Lives. In the next episode, we're going to be looking at someone who is very connected to the eunuch, and that was the concubine. Thanks for listening to this episode. For more information, including show notes, maps, and a bibliography, go to ottomanlives.com. Also, if you like this show, please rate and review us on your podcast player of choice. It helps us grow the show and make it easier for new listeners to discover us. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.